Welcome back to the Cruise Elite Podcast, and I'm sitting here with Tony. Tony's my podcast producer. You probably remember him from the last episode, and we're back to talk about breathing today, actually, which I think was a really cool idea. Tony, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm excited to learn all about this. How are you? I'm good. It's Friday, so that means I'm starting to shift my thoughts towards fishing this weekend fly fishing yeah yeah so i was gonna ask if like weekends were were true weekends for you or in your work if you didn't think of them as such well yeah i mean it's our weekend generally has some work involved but i try to save a day not sure which day i'm going this weekend but often it's saturday to get out there and fly fish so i live in you know the mountains of new hampshire so it's been my hobby for a long time and my passion. And so once Friday comes around, that's where my mind starts to go. Uh, do you go by yourself? Yes, most of the time, but that's only because it's getting harder and harder to make plans with my fishing buddies. But I have a couple of fishing buddies for sure. And uh, it's just it's just become difficult to, you know, for our schedules to align. So most of the time these days, I'm solo just because I got to fish when I can fish. So yeah. I don't mind going by myself. It's fun. Yeah. I've been fly fishing exactly one time, but it was super cool because it was during a cicada oh, uh, cool. season. So there was this huge brood around the DC area. Um, that's where I live. And uh, yeah, we had people kind of like hiking by the river and looking at us like, what are you trying to catch? Like, you can't catch trout here. And the guide who was with us was like, uh, you'll see. Like cicada season is just totally different. That's awesome. Sure enough, we were pulling them up pretty regularly at some points, which was so oh, fun. Nice. So you got a little spoiled your first time out. Yeah. 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 I mean, there there was definitely like stretches of just nothing. Yeah. And it's like, am I doing this right? I got it caught in the tree. Oh, and gosh. Branches. Yeah. And <laughs> it doesn't matter how many years you fly fish for. Usually an outing always consists of getting caught in the tree at least once and <laughs> Yeah. I tie my own flies and put so much time into it and take them out there, tie one on, fire it into the tree, get stuck, break it off. <laughs> Just yeah. 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 Well, enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah, Something I'm, to look forward to. For sure. You know, I did want to ask you also about uh, this hip mobility challenge that yes. I've been seeing you talking about. You're almost wrapping up entry for that right yeah exactly so we actually start the challenge on monday so we've been talking about it now for a couple of weeks and what we do periodically is run a free hip mo or a free mobility challenge we've done it for other body parts as well and right now we're focused on the hips so it's a four week long free program and basically what happens is we have a couple of different programs designed that are inside the platform that we use. And so people can join the platform and go through the routines. But then I also go live every single day of the week and I'll do a noontime call and it gives me a chance to demonstrate exercises, provide coaching, answer questions. A lot of the time I spend that those live calls teaching people how to sort of modify the exercises a little bit, depending on what they need for their body. You know, what equipment do they need? How can you use the things that you already have to make the exercise more accessible? That kind of thing. And then I also just include really cool educational lessons for people. And usually it's the stuff that really excites me about the nervous system. So I can teach people how to assess their own body's response to the exercises. And that helps them understand how to make smarter decisions as to which exercises are the right ones for them. So it's a really good time. And I think people find it really fascinating to uh, start to get that education around how the brain and the nervous system is so involved in movement and maybe the pain or the mobility restrictions that they're experiencing. Yeah. And that's pretty awesome that people get individual feedback from you throughout that. I mean, daily, that's, that's a lot. That's awesome. It's a lot. And so we've, we've done this model one other time. So last April, we ran this same hip challenge and we decided, all right, we're going live every single day of the week. And it ended up being awesome. And then we did some other challenges after that with different body parts. And we didn't do the daily live, 
but we've now come back to it because we actually think that it helped people like it helped give people enough exposure to not only the exercises, but the education. So they knew why they were doing what we were asking them to do. But then there's also a great accountability piece because there's like some excitement, like, okay, tomorrow we're back on a live call and the next day we're back on a live call. And I think it helps people form the habit of doing the routines and that's key. Yeah. I just know what the, in this age of information, you know, it's like, you'll be scrolling on online on Instagram, uh, listening to podcasts, reading books, whatever it is. And it's just like, I want to do five programs at once. Like it's, it's so hard to just stick to one thing when you're constantly getting introduced to other ideas and concepts. And so I think that's cool that you're reinforcing it over the course of those four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it seems to be super useful for folks. Well, let's let's talk about breathing. Let's do it. You know, I know that you have talked a lot about breathing in the past uh, with specific protocols and exercises. You said something in the last episode that really kind of piqued my interest, which was you were talking about forms of fuel and you were like, breathing is a form of fuel, right? Yes. And I think that most of us don't even think of it as such we don't think about breathing at all. And if we do, it's because we're out of breath. (laughs) Yes. Good point. So I was just going to ask like uh, to start, like, why don't you give us your sort of broad thoughts on, on breathing and its importance in daily life, but also in, in training and in neuromuscular therapies? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess where I would start with that is why I got introduced to breathing as a potential training modality in the first place. And because back when, you know, I was in a learning phase and doing a lot of strength and conditioning and just exploring different philosophies, interestingly, breathing was never really a part of that. Hmm. And it wasn't until I started working more with clients that were having pain issues that in my pursuit to keep learning, I started coming across information on how breathing is something that you should absolutely be assessing in your clients, because if they have any type of breathing dysfunction, it could absolutely be leading them to a place where they experience more pain. So like we talked about in the last episode, when I was describing Z Health, when I got into the Z Health curriculum, one of the courses that I took later on put a large emphasis on assessing people's breathing and assessing it to help them with pain issues, but also assessing it so that you could train your breathing to become better at it. And there's a lot of reasons why you might want to do that. So it all started for me with clients that were very challenging to help. And so then I was able to then now assess their breathing and figure out if this was a powerful category for them. And it turns out that for most people, it really is. Yeah. So let's dig into that. Like, what would be something, what would be a common form of dysfunctional breathing that might be causing problems, causing pain? Sure. So the first thing that I think about is somebody who might be chronically mouth breathing. Mm. So a lot of people don't know this, but your nose is for breathing, not your mouth. And you can mouth breathe when you're doing intense exercise. So everybody, you know, anyone who's experienced really intense exercise understands that eventually you're going to be panting coming from your mouth. And and that's okay. I'm not saying that that's necessarily wrong, but I, I can tell you that your ability to become better at nasal breathing can improve so that you don't have to rely as much on mouth breathing or as soon when exercise gets intense. Mm -hmm. But all the other time that we're going through our daily battles and whatever it is that we do during the day that is not intense exercise, we really should be breathing through our nose. So your nose is for breathing. And what happens is people can develop a certain kind of breathing dysfunction where they become more of a chronic mouth breather. And this actually can be impacting them during the day. They could be mouth breathing during the day. Some people mouth breathe at night when they're sleeping. 
And it's not a healthy thing in the long term because it actually throws off the chemistry of your body. And anyone who has ever had a cold and noticed that their mouth and throat got really dry at night and they woke up and they needed, you know, to drink water and they had a scratchy throat. Most of the time when that happens and what's going on is you're breathing through your mouth in your sleep. And what happens the next day when you wake up, you say, wow, I really feel like crap. Mm -hmm. I wonder why I feel like crap. And my throat was scratchy and I woke myself up from snoring, you know, whatever the case might be. That's often how people feel after a night of mouth breathing. And that's because it throws off the chemistry of your body. So you could have lower energy and you can actually have higher pain levels. So mouth breathing is a big one. It's the first one that really comes to mind. But another one that is really important is what we call an upper chest breathing pattern. So when a person is at rest and they're just breathing normally, you basically don't want to see any movement at all, maybe a little, but it's very, very subtle movement in the chest region. So we actually have like a test that we have people do where you put one hand on your abdomen and one hand on your chest. I'm, d- I'm doing and this you right just kind of Yeah, you just kind of breathe regularly. And really what I should see as the coach is a little bit of a wave happening where I will see your bottom hand move first as you start to inhale. And then I might see a little bit of movement on that top hand, but it shouldn't be vertical movement. Your hand should not move up. Mm. And if your hand is moving up, it means that your shoulders are getting closer to your ears, right? And that would be the upper chest breathing pattern that is more associated with elevated sympathetics, which means higher levels of stress. And usually when people are stuck in a chronic pattern of upper chest breathing, they're usually the individuals that tell you they have chronic pain or some body part hurts or whatever the case may be. Maybe we're even talking about struggling with uh, anxiety or something like that. So I always assess people's breathing patterns and I do that high-low test that you just tried right away to get a sense for, hey, is this person breathing in a very relaxed fashion or do I see excessive movement where I don't want to see it? And if I see that, then I'm starting to think, oh, okay, we're probably going to have to not only incorporate some breathing strategies for this individual, but we'll probably have to figure out ways to use movement to elicit more of like a parasympathetic response, which is a fancy way of saying a down regulation or kind of relaxation effect Mm -hmm. from movement. Yeah. Yeah, I just feel like there's so many things that you said that apply to me personally. So I'll try not to make this <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> let's follow up on. on the, uh, <laughs> but but yeah, no, super fascinating. So you said initially that you would start assessing breathing for clients that had problems that you were otherwise not solving with other protocols. Is this something that you you still reserve as sort of like a later tool in the quiver? Or is this something that you assess kind of off the bat? That's a great question. A lot of that just comes down to taking a person's history. So first, I listen to a person explain to me, you know, whatever we're talking about in regards to their history. And there are certain things that kind of tip me off that breathing might be an important category to hit first. So it does come down to the individual and their history. But if I start hearing things like, you know, I had childhood asthma or you know, I struggle with asthma right now, or I struggle with anxiety, or I have chronic pain, oftentimes neck pain, mid back pain, low back pain, the it's kind of the midline of the body Hmm. is often an area that's pretty related to breathing issues. Like, do you think that's postural or some of it will be a lot of it too, is that when a person is struggling with an upper chest breathing pattern and they're say mouth breathing, their, their rate of respiration is usually too fast 
It's faster than we would like it to be. And what happens is you have accessory muscles that get too involved in the breathing process. And so oftentimes you have people talking about having really tight neck muscles or having tightness in their shoulders or around their rib cage. And those are also kind of clues to me when I'm going through a history with somebody that they might actually be dealing with some breathing dysfunction and those accessory muscles are just becoming overworked and tight. And eventually, you know, that's a compensatory strategy to help the person breathe. Mm -hmm. So in the short term, those muscles are being a hero, but in the long term, they get tired and they don't want to do it anymore. And that's when you start having chronic pain issues in those body parts. Wow. Interesting. So let's say like you figured out someone has a uh, dysfunction in their breathing. What are you doing next? That's a great question as well. So and it, it depends on the individual. So there's different forms of breathing exercises, different styles of breathing exercises. And people will generally respond differently to those different styles. and not all breathing exercises are going to be the right exercise for the person. So again, I'm going by history, and then I'm also assessing their response to anything that we try, any exercise that we try. And their assessment responses will kind of give me clues as to what kind of breathing exercise might be best for them. So when I think about breathing and the nervous system, I have a grouping of breathing exercises that are a bit more sympathetic in nature. And what that means is they are more stimulating. Mm -hmm. People, I think, recognize the term like fight or flight. So when we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system, we're talking about the fight or flight part of the nervous system. And believe it or not, it gets a bad rep. Believe it or not, sometimes we want to activate that. Yeah, sure. And one really good example of that is if you're an athlete, and you are about to compete, do you think that doing breathing exercises that are going to relax you and mellow you out is the right idea? And not always, because you want your sympathetics to, you want them to become elevated so that you can perform well. Yeah. That being said, if you're the athlete that's, you know, worried about choking and you have high levels of anxiety, your nerves are really bothering you you know, you're, you're getting stressed from the idea of performing, you might need to do some breathing exercises that do the opposite. They're more of the parasympathetic style of breathing drills, which is more down regulating for kind of mellowing you out. Yeah. So it depends on the individual and assessing and reassessing is really key for figuring out which drills a person needs. But I can tell you from experience that most of the time when a person is an overbreather, meaning they are breathing too fast chronically during the day. And maybe they are doing that with mouth breathing. And maybe they have the upper chest breathing pattern that we described. Most of the time where I start with that individual is with an exercise called the diaphragm stretch. And the diaphragm stretch is what it sounds like. It's a way to stretch your diaphragm and your diaphragm is your main muscle for breathing. So it is uh, around kind of your lower ribs. It, if you've seen a picture of it, it looks like a big parachute, but it's very, very thin. It's a thin muscle and it has attachments to your rib cage and also your lower back, your lumbar spine. And oftentimes when you are in that cycle of breathing that's too fast and upper chest dominant, we need to stretch your diaphragm because getting your diaphragm to reach its end range of motion is just similar to like getting your muscles, mm -hmm. stretching your muscles to their end range of motion or moving a joint to their end range of motion is healthy. Doing that with your diaphragm is extremely healthy because it will often help you breathe better afterwards because you're mobilizing it. So I often start with that exercise for that type of person. Yeah. Yeah the theme is not lost on me. Try something, but assess. Exactly. Assess, assess, assess. You know, it's, 
you kind of get this sense that people, uh, that the experts, you know, have have this all just kind of figured out and they can just kind of look at you and say, well, you need to do X, Y, and Z, but you have your intuitions or your, your theories, right? But you always test with assessments. So I just wanted to underscore that because yeah, it seems to be a fundamental yeah. uh, pillar here. Oh, it is. It is. And I really appreciate that point. I really appreciate that point because everybody responds differently. So even when I'm taking a history and I'm going through assessments and I'm watching a person move, I make educated guesses, basically, mm -hmm. with the information that I have and seeing a person move. But at the end of the day, I have to really let the assessment responses guide me. And that's why with all of our mobility challenges and inside our membership and stuff, the main thing that we are doing is teaching people how to assess their body's response to anything. So the goal with these breathing exercises, with these interventions, is to promote a healthier form of breathing throughout. And, and the idea is you peel that layer off, that layer of dysfunction away, and hopefully good things happen, right? And then maybe you can figure out what, what other issues there are beneath that. Yeah, 100%. And guess what? It's not that easy to fix. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it were, but here's the deal. Breathing is very reflexive, so that means that it happens automatically. So I think it's somewhere around, I don't know, 20,000, maybe 22,000 breaths per day is what the average person takes. And because it's so reflexive, obviously, we're not thinking about each one of those breaths. Like you said, we only think about our breathing when we're out of breath. <laughs> That's really funny and true. So you're breathing all the time. You're just not paying attention to it. So anytime you have something that is that reflexive and you also have that many repetitions during the day, those things become harder to fix mm. because they're not easily controlled voluntarily. So like I can't say to you, hey, Tony, I want you to breathe this way for now on. And you're going to feel better and it's going to help your posture because now you're putting thought into an activity that by design, we're not really supposed to be thinking about mm -hmm. because it's so reflexive. We have higher order systems as far as our brain and nervous system goes that are involved in controlling our breathing. So it's not easy to fix because you have to figure out a way to interfere with a person's poor breathing patterns for long enough that it then grants them X amount of healthier breaths. Mm -hmm. And then maybe that turns into more. So there's different ways you can approach it. The first one though, interestingly, is awareness because most people have no idea that their breathing could be dysfunctional when you present it to them. And so first having that conversation and getting them to be more aware of it is actually useful because people will tell you, oh, I actually caught myself mouth breathing today and I noticed it. And so I, you know, I made sure that I wasn't doing that or, you know, they find that they're doing something posturally that is causing them to have poor breathing. And so then they sort of fix, you know, how they're maybe sitting or, you know, whatever the case. So there's ways to interfere with it a little bit to get the process going, but then you have to get a person to do enough work of the right exercises. So let's say we do the diaphragm stretch and the diaphragm stretch helps grant person the person 50 more new healthy breaths. Mm. You need to get them to do that enough to interfere with the poor breathing during the day so that they keep getting those healthier breaths. And then the plan is that as they integrate that into their life, you just keep building, you keep building and it takes some work, but one of the really unique ways to make some change rather quickly when a person is a mouth breather or an upper chest breather is to actually have them tape their mouth closed, either with exercise or with sleeping. Yeah, my buddy swears by this. He's been using something uh, 
I won't say the brand, but basically a brand of tape for that reason yeah. to sleep with. So I've been really curious about that. I was actually going to ask you about it. <coughs> Is coughing a dysfunctional form of breathing or a functional <laughs> form of breathing? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting. So the whole mouth tape thing, my goodness, that can work good. So hmm. that is something I've, I've explored with a number of clients, often clients that are kind of complaining of poor energy in the morning, difficult starting their day, or they have back pain, chronic back pain with no injury event. And it just, uh, you know, there's no reason why they should have the back pain necessarily. So I've had people try this and I always get back really interesting and cool results um, about it. And it's hard for people at first sometimes because basically what happens is you you put tape on your mouth and some people hear that and they, they get scared. They're like, mm-hmm. well, I, I would never want to do that. And usually if you get scared by the idea of doing it, it probably means that you are mouth breathing to some capacity. And you feel reliant on your mouth for breathing. Mm -hmm. So all you're doing is taking basically medical tape is like a really like, it's not very sticky at all. It's not like duct tape. Mm -hmm. So people have this idea in their head of using like duct tape. No. So you take some medical tape and you just, you know, gently tape your, your lips together. And all it is, is a reminder. Mm -hmm. So it's giving you some proprioceptive feedback Mm -hmm. to keeping your mouth closed. And, you know, you go to sleep with it on. And honestly, what happens the first two weeks is the person just takes it off in their sleep. And then they tell you, oh, I I wore it. But at some point I ripped it off. Mm -hmm. So it comes off really easily and people then feel safe about it. But it's cool because as you build up, basically, as you get used to it and you no longer take it off, what's happening is it's forcing you to nasal breathe. And if you are a person that has been a chronic mouth breather, all of a sudden now you're breathing through your nose, which is a lot healthier for you. And you wake up with better energy, less pain. You see, hear some pretty cool results from people using that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's on my list of, of things to try. So, so what is it? I mean, you mentioned uh, the rate of breathing is different usually with mouth breathing and nasal breathing. Is that the whole story yeah. as to why it's healthier or why is the nose for breathing? So it's it's not the whole story, but yeah. So basically we want to have a rate of respiration that is in the healthy zone. And what you often find with people who are mouth breathing and have the upper chest breathing pattern is they're breathing too fast. And so they might have like, say, 22 breaths or more in a minute. And that's just at rest. And it's actually kind of hard to assess on yourself because what happens is once you once you hit a timer or something and, and you start focusing on your breathing, you're now focusing on it and things become more voluntary. So it's yeah. kind of difficult. So what I always do when I'm trying to help people with this is I try to get my information while I'm just talking to them. And when someone is breathing, uh, over breathing chronically, You can usually just see their chest moving and their shoulders rising up towards their ears. So I get an idea of how many breaths per minute they might have. And that also gives me a clue. So generally speaking, if you're up around like 22 breaths per minute, I think it would be or over that. We're going to call that too fast. And you're probably you're probably mouth breathing and upper chest breathing. So with the nasal breathing, what happens when you're when you breathe through your nose, you actually warm the air coming in, which is quite useful. And it's also like a built-in filtration system. Your nose is like one of your first line defenses against anything coming in. So it's like a filter. And when you breathe through your mouth, you don't have that. So oftentimes people who have been stuck in a mouth breathing habit for a very long period of time also complain of immunity issues, mm-hmm. low immunity. And that's just simply because they don't have that filter. So there's there's lots of cool little benefits to breathing through your nose. One of the ones that is most important to me is it comes down to CO2 tolerance. So when you breathe through your nose, you actually build up a better tolerance to CO2 than if you're breathing through your mouth. And so what happens is as CO2 is building, 
it will eventually trigger you to want to breathe. So imagine you're underwater, you're swimming underwater, you're holding your breath, and you're starting to sense that feeling of air hunger where it's time to come up and breathe. What's happening is your CO2 levels are building, which is normal, but there's a threshold. And what happens is the CO2 triggers the reflexive action to now inhale. It's a built-in survival mechanism. So what happens is when you're a chronic mouth breather and you're you're disrupting the balance of oxygen and CO2, that's not a good thing. And we can balance that out better by breathing through our nose. And what happens with nasal breathing and other forms of training that utilize the nose for breathing is you start building a better tolerance to CO2. And what that feels like is you get more comfortable with the idea of feeling air hungry. Mm -hmm. which is actually an amazing thing for an athlete, but it's actually great for anybody. And what generally happens is you stop needing to breathe as quickly as maybe you once did, and you become more comfortable with the sensation of air hunger. Your CO2 tolerance improves. And it's actually the CO2 training itself. That's what we call it. It's in the category of what we would tell people is uh, chemistry breathing drills when the focus is more on building the CO2 tolerance. Hmm. It's a really healthy thing for blood flow. So one of the unique benefits of doing either nasal breathing exercises or what I call air hunger exercises, which is literally exercising while not breathing. Mm -hmm. So imagine exhaling everything holding your breath and then becoming active in some way, whether you're doing like body weight squats or walking or even running, that's a form of exercise that we call air hunger exercise. And it is excellent for delivering oxygen to your body's tissues and even your brain. So that's part of the reason why it's healthy. And it's actually one of the big reasons why when I do sessions with people, and they have chronic pain that seems to be really stubborn and hard mm -hmm. to deal with, doing some bouts of air hunger exercise can actually decrease their pain significantly in session because they're building up more CO2 in their body and their brain likes that. And therefore, the pain output decreases. So to simplify, and let me know if I'm oversimplifying it, mm -hmm. are we, by improving our CO2 tolerance are we removing a bit of our threat level in the threat bucket because we're no longer as air hungry as quickly yes yeah so exactly that's that's one of the things that's happening is you're decreasing the threat for sure and when you decrease threat in any way what you generally see is a decrease in pain and an increase in performance so that's definitely how i look at it and that would be how i explain it to somebody that I'm, I'm working with. And again, it comes down to finding the right breathing exercises for a person, because here's the interesting thing. If you do the wrong breathing style for exercise, mm -hmm. it can do the opposite. And that's why you have to test. You cannot assume that because you read a book on breathing or you found <laughs> a guru on breathing, and, and there's a lot of great stuff out there in terms of breathing but everybody becomes biased to the system that's helping them. Right. And just because it's helping them doesn't mean now it's the right one for you. So an example is if somebody is very sensitive to breathing drills, they might be the type of person that tells you, hey, I, I did that meditation stuff and, you know, I... I did the breathing exercises that I was told to do and I turned down the lights and I laid on my back and I I did the, you know, relaxation based breathing and I threw in the meditation and whatever and honestly it increased my anxiety. And I mm. might hear that. I've heard that many times in the past. And so the point is the relaxation based breathing techniques that might help one person relax and feel better might do the exact opposite to somebody else. And I've even had instances where instead of needing 
you know, the diaphragm stretch, which I view as more of like a parasympathetic relaxation based breathing drill. Instead of needing that, I've actually had to have people practice hyperventilation, where now the style of breathing is exactly the opposite. It's very fast and rapid. And I have them like practice rhythms when they're doing it. So we've got a bunch of different drills that fall into, again, kind of like the air hunger category where you're doing like a certain number of sniffs in followed by Mm -hmm. a certain number of puffs out. And we literally call it puff breathing because it sounds like, and we have different rhythms and, and stuff. One of my favorite exercises actually is called a breath ladder where you do one in, one out, two in, two out, three and three, and you keep Mm. building up the ladder and you try to get to 10. So there's like a lot of control that's involved with it. There's a lot of maintaining rhythm. So again, the point being like, there's different styles of breathing exercises. And I think when people hear about training their breathing, they sort of have this stereotypical, you know, picture in their head of, again, lights are out, you're laying down, Mm -hmm. you're doing relaxed kind of yoga style breathing, maybe. Mm -hmm. And there's more to it than that. And the what you respond to, you know, might be different than what you think. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, Speaking of gurus that uh, rhythmic puff breathing, it reminds me of what I heard about the Wim Hof method. Yeah, Uh, it seems like that's that's sort of what they're tapping into when they do that. Yeah, they do. So the I don't know what so I don't know a ton about Wim Hof. Like I, I see stuff on social media and stuff, and I do read a little bit about it because it's super intriguing. And obviously, the system gets phenomenal results if you read about them. But I also have had people tell me like, "Hey, I tried that, and it really didn't work for me." And it, you know, there were some negative consequences to it. And so again, that makes sense to me because looking yeah. through it, looking through the lens of neurology, you know, one style is going to be better than another but they do kind of a mix of stuff i think in that philosophy so it's kind of cool yeah you know try it but assess right yeah exactly try deep yoga breathing and meditate but assess 100 percent. there's no there's no right or wrong necessarily you just have to know enough to pay attention to your body's response so that you can understand which way to go with it yeah i do think uh my short-lived bouts with meditation were some of the times where I thought about breathing the most, mm-hmm. but also in a, in like a fitness training context. Like, uh, I remember reading about the Valsalva maneuver, you know, yeah. I was doing starting strength and that was like a big part of that. Or, you know, like a, a lot of the hard style kettlebell people talk about exhaling almost like a, you know, like you're a martial artist, like a, like yeah. a tsa, or like a, Absolutely. I don't even know what you would the call key that. The, the key eye. The key eye. Yeah. 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 It's funny, Tony. I just had this conversation yesterday on a live call with our members because there was a couple good questions that came up and we were talking about, you know, how to appropriately breathe with exercise and mm-hmm. what's a key eye for. And um, definitely those are also important, important things to understand with breathing. In the realm of, of you know, all of these different techniques, it sounds like you you are mostly focused on how to get people to breathe better on a daily basis because yes. that's sort of like a global factor that could help improve people's performance and experience day to day. A hundred percent. It's massive threat reduction for a person. Yeah. Massive because if you transform their breathing into something healthier now and those 22,000 breaths that they take in a day are now better breaths in terms of the rhythm and, you know, nasal breathing, you start seeing some really profound changes in a person's health. And it's not just in the mechanics of their breathing. It actually can impact so many other different aspects of their health because now they are rebalancing their chemistry, their internal body chemistry. And anytime that you start doing that, you can start to see improvements in other issues that you didn't expect. Yeah. Everything's connected. And so true in this sense, do you notice a big difference between athletes versus non-athletes in terms of the prominence of dysfunctional breathing or the ability to breathe diaphragmatically or anything like that? 
It's interesting you bring that up. So when I first started working more with endurance athletes, I had the assumption that they were going to be great at breathing. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered after testing lots of them is that they might not be, which I found really, really fascinating. And I guess the point is that cardiovascular fitness Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily, or having good cardiovascular fitness doesn't necessarily mean that you have healthy breathing patterns. In fact, some of these like really long distance endurance athletes that I've worked with, they're essentially professional hyperventilators. So because they are exercising at such a high intensity for such a long period of time, they become extremely efficient with the upper chest breathing pattern. Hmm. So there's a consequence to that if it carries into your life. And so sometimes with endurance athletes, I have to help them learn this stuff about breathing and start to integrate it into their life because endurance athletes are constantly balancing this line of being essentially over sympathetic, if you want to call it that, like their sympathetics are super elevated from having essentially a a heavy training volume. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they are not able to downregulate when they need to, which is really important for the recovery process. So you want your sympathetics elevated when you're training and it's helping you kick butt. But then when you're not training, you don't want that happening in other parts of your life when it's time to rest and digest and go to sleep. Yeah. So sometimes these endurance athletes basically become professional hyperventilators and you have to give them strategies to do the opposite. That's where our diaphragm stretch comes into play, working on doing some other exercises that we call three-dimensional breathing, where you're essentially working on your breathing mobility of your rib cage. And you're doing a lot of like slower nasal based inhalation work and focusing on expanding your ribs and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. They need some of that uh, to help them down regulate when it's appropriate and kind of separate the upper chest breathing that they might do as a competitor versus the more relaxed breathing that we need from them when they're just going about their life and not training. Yeah, that is that is surprising, uh, but it makes sense the way you've described it. So you uh, do jujitsu, right? Yes. You go, I don't know, how many days a week are you doing it nowadays? Well, right now, so my goal is always three times. Yeah. And I'm going to increase that come this winter once I get cabin fever. Yeah. I want it. So basically... <laughs> It's funny. Once you can't fly fish, right? That's exactly what I was going to say. So here's the deal. (laughs) Fly fishing is the only thing that can pull me away from other things that I like. Wow. So during the peak fly fishing months, and we're in one of them right now, it's a little bit of a struggle for me. It's a balancing act because I want to get out there and fish and it takes time away from jujitsu. So right now, I've kind of been average. It's lower volume for me right now or lower frequency. I've been averaging like twice a week. I will get in three times a week sometimes, but uh, that's just if the fishing conditions don't pan out. As soon as winter rolls around, I'm going to increase that. And I'm actually considering trying to crank it up to about four times uh, occasionally. Yeah. So it sounds like you're going to have to uh, focus more on uh, down regulating and getting your recovery time because you're going to be that much more amped up and battered up every yeah week. yeah i will have to increase the time i spend recovering from it and doing drills and just keeping keeping my body healthy yeah um the the reason why i brought up jujitsu is you know you were talking about athletes and you know how certain breathing protocols might be the exact opposite of what they actually need to perform in that moment yes I think jujitsu is an interesting one because you can be very explosive and it's a combat sport. You have live resistance, a live, live, uh, opponent. And, yes. you know, I think people do get very amped up and I know that also you don't want to gas yourself out in the first minute and then you're just putty for your opponent to do with what they will. Right. So when you're thinking about jujitsu, are you thinking about breathing? And if you did, just walk us through how you would think about breathing in that context. Absolutely. So what you just described 
is the best advice for a white belt ever. <laughs> so here's what here's what typically happens when you start jujitsu, regardless of your experience with other sports. Hmm. You come in and you're a white belt. You don't know anything. And all of a sudden, somebody's trying to strangulate you and pull your limbs off your body. It is not pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> but interestingly, they refer to it as the gentle sport because you're supposed to get to a level where things flow mm -hmm. and you move very efficiently. And even though it's a very rough sport, you know, you get to a point where you're not really putting in a tremendous amount of effort in a certain way and things become really efficient and they flow. Well, what happens with a white belt when someone's attacking you, it causes you to breathe really fast and stiffen up and you build tension in your body and it builds up a lot of threat in the moment. And so the kiss of death for the white belt is not understanding how to control their breathing and they build all that tension in their body and tension is sort of the enemy of efficiency. So once you build up hmm. a lot of tension in your body, you can't breathe very well. And remember now somebody's on top of you trying to smother you. And there's even positions where someone has their knee in your belly or, you know, they're wrapping their, you know, arm around your neck and it's it's tough. Breathing is fundamental in jujitsu. So one of the things that has to happen in the evolution of, you know, going from a white belt to a blue belt and beyond is you have to get really comfortable with stress. It's actually one of the biggest benefits of the sport of jujitsu hmm. is being able to handle threat in the moment because this is all going down and at, your heart rate is up while all this is happening. You're, you're breathing heavy. You're tired. Like you said, you're explosive one moment. And then the next moment, you know, you might not be, but you have a, you know, you're holding a lot of isometric tension in your body. It's very fatiguing. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn how to control your breathing. So I really can't say there's a perfect way to breathe, but what it, what it comes down to is being able to consciously remind yourself to stay relaxed is huge in preserving your energy. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to just have a lot better endurance for what you're doing. So for example, last night, at jujitsu, when I was getting pounded by one of our black belts, I had to remind myself in the process of trying to stay alive that <laughs> I had to keep my arms really close to my body and protect myself. And I had to maintain tension in my body to do that. But I also had to make sure that I was still breathing and I was putting myself in a position where I could still breathe. Because being able to continue to breathe is what allows me to fight out of certain positions and regain control and, you know, whatever happens. So it's, it's super fundamental in jujitsu and it is the hardest thing to overcome when you first get started. Yeah, I believe that. Do you think increasing your CO2 threshold is a potential training avenue for sparring athletes to get better in those positions? A hundred percent. So increasing your CO2 tolerance goes a long way in the sport of jujitsu because jujitsu is air hunger. Every single mm. part of jujitsu involves air hunger. So what increasing your CO2 tolerance will do for you is get you more comfortable with that sensation. And it will also help you get to a point where your tolerance is greater so that sensation doesn't get as extreme or it takes longer for you to get air hungry. So it's a great avenue to train for jujitsu athletes. And then the other thing that I'll say about that is there's some really cool things that jujitsu athletes can do. One of them is learning how to breathe better while they have, um, while they're under force. So one of the things I like to do is use isometrics as a training mm -hmm. method. So isometrics, meaning you are contracting your muscles against an immovable object, mm -hmm. right? That's a form of isometrics. There's other forms, but that's a, you know, that's a common one. And I've got a cool tool for that. I actually use furniture moving straps and you can buy them really cheaply and you step on them. And then they have like these felt lined loops and you hook the loops onto your arms and your legs and you get creative with the different positions 
But what you do is you contract your muscles against the strap. And now you have a full body isometric exercise because the strap's not letting you move. Right. And then once you have that high level of tension, you can actually practice keeping your breathing rhythmic. And basically, you can practice continuing to breathe because what happens is people generally have a tendency to stop breathing when tension goes up high. Mm -hmm. And that's what fatigues you out. Mm -hmm. So that's a cool way to train. And then you can also just like put heavy things on you, like sandbags, medicine balls, things like that, and then focus on maintaining enough tension to protect yourself from the weight of those implements while still being able to calmly breathe. Yeah, that sounds awesome. It's <laughs> to circle back to what we were talking about earlier in the episode. It's like, I want to try all of these things yeah. all at once, you know, in addition to what I'm already supposed to be doing consistently. Yeah. Uh, there, there's so much here. Do you think we're we're missing anything like really just kind of fundamental about breathing that we haven't covered? I think we hit on some good stuff. I think the next step is for people to get an experience of a breathing exercise. And so I was thinking I would just describe that diaphragm stretch mm -hmm. so that our listeners can kind of give that a try. It's really easy. It's, uh, it's an intense exercise, but it's easy to do. So what you do is you could even do this sitting up, but ideally you could lay down and you'd have your legs bent. And I often have people put their hands on their rib cage so that when they inhale and exhale, they actually feel movement just for a little bit of feedback. What you end up doing is you take a great big inhale through your nose, and then you open your mouth and your throat and you forcefully exhale everything until you have nothing left. So you make this sound. And it's a very deep hiss, gurgly sound. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. And you want to exhale everything out until you have nothing left. And then you want to continue to exhale as if you do have more left. And you'll feel a lot of muscular work happening in your abdomen and like around your obliques. And what happens during that extra, say, three to four seconds is you get air hungry. There's a little bit of air hunger that builds. And that is good. I actually want people to feel some air hunger with this. And then after you're done with the exhale, you simply relax and you recover your breathing through your nose. Okay. So that's one repetition of a diaphragm stretch. And you want to put some effort into this. So you don't want it to feel like you're not getting muscular contraction when you do it. You actually want to ramp up the intensity rather high, provided you're not getting like cramps in your back and stuff, because some people can cramp a little bit in their lower back. And if that happens, it's no big deal. You can usually shake it out. But then the next time through, you would just back off on the intensity of exhale a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so you might do this, say, three repetitions. You might do this for five repetitions and see how you feel afterwards. Test some ranges of motion, forward bends, rotate through the trunk, check shoulder range of motion. Ideally, you would even do that before testing the exercise or doing the exercise. So you have like a baseline comparison and see how it improves your mobility. A mm -hmm. lot of times people get massive improvements in their mobility. So that's a cool experience is to have a breathing drill help you like that. And then remember what I said about how that will not help everyone. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just it is what it is, right? I think the diaphragm stretch is probably work pretty well for about 70% of people just experientially. But sometimes that's not the case. So then if that was not the road to take, I would probably gravitate more towards air hunger work, where now I would encourage somebody to just exhale normally, and then hold your breath and become active as you're holding your breath. So body weight squats would be a good thing mm -hmm. to do if you don't have any issue with squatting. If you do, you could do some uh, some marching in place or some walking, and you're going to continue to move until you start to feel the first signs of air hunger. Once you sense that air hunger, you might go a few more repetitions, but then you want to stop and recover through your nose. That's really important. And you might do that a few bouts. So you kind of fully recover, and then you repeat the process. And then you can test how you respond from 
increasing your CO2, same range of motion tests or whatever you'd like, pain, that kind of thing. And oftentimes what you'll find is like one of these categories could be the one that's best for you. Sometimes they're both good for you. That's best case scenario. But those would be yeah. two good examples for people to try. No, that's fantastic. Is there a, a place where people can reach out if they try this at home and, and just let you know how it went? Or uh, Yeah, absolutely. So obviously people can find me in the DMs on my Instagram account, and I, I happily answer questions there. We also have a free community. So we have a free community that we call the Dojo, and you can find that free community if you go to the link in our bio on Instagram. And we'll also put it in the show notes. And that is, uh, that's a great resource. There's actually a lot of discussion that happens in the dojo around breathing. And you could absolutely share your experience with me there. And I can help you out in any way possible. Yeah, that would be really cool. Well, this is awesome. I've, I've learned so much. I hope everyone else has learned so much as well. I'm glad you wanted to talk about breathing. This was cool. <laughs> yeah, I feel like, I feel like, uh, there's so much ground to cover. We could easily circle back on this uh, at some point and just dive even deeper. Definitely. That's it, Tony. I hope you guys learned something here about breathing. I know we'll definitely be back to this topic in the future because it's just the tip of the iceberg. If you want to learn more, please follow the podcast, check out the website and dojo, and come along for the ride. I promise you'll learn valuable lessons and build a tool set that will help you keep training pain-free for years to come. Thanks again for listening.